Bye. Alright guys. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't, uh, we didn't really have uh, Blackpink today uh, on, on the Pure Sarah Road show. That was an advertisement on Spotify. So, well, good afternoon once again. Welcome back to another Road Show with Pure 71 Smart Port Challenge. I'm Ning, Program Manager at Pure 71, and today we'll be hearing from Platinus Digital on accurate information about trap vessel schedule uh, for decision and for more information on Smart Port Challenge, as well as all the innovation opportunities that are being put up by uh, the maritime corporates and other organizations, please head over to www.peersand1.sg. And today's session will be recorded and the recording will be made available once the session ends. And today we have Tim Paulson, uh, Business Development Manager at uh, Blacklist Digital. And, but just before we begin, I have one more reminder to everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A section. You can find the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Now, without uh, further ado, Tim, would you like to share a little bit about Platinus Digital as well as yourself, please? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Just give me two seconds to share my screen. So can you see that okay, Ning? Yep. Okay, so to very briefly introduce Clavinus Digital, uh, we are a digital company that was spun out of the 75 year old ship owner, operator uh, and manager, Torvald Clavinus, who uh, I'm sure in Singapore needs no introduction. Uh, they saw a need that customers in the heavy industry sector were coordinating shipments manually and by spreadsheets. And so Torval Klavinitz uh, took in a team of software experts and data scientists to develop a system that is now Cargo Value, which is our flagship system. So to introduce a little bit about what Cargo Value does, it just takes all the tasks in the supply chain management of shipping bulk materials, so whether liquid or dry bulk. Uh, it takes the coordinating task away from email, phone, and spreadsheets and antiquated ERP systems, and it uh, puts it in one cloud-based platform where everybody in the shipping process can collaborate. So this has been built uh, in conjunction with major customers of Torval Clavinus, which include uh, Aluminium Bahrain, one of the first ones, uh, and uh, Ali Norte, and other aluminium smelters. And uh, more recent customers include BHP, uh, the major mining company, um, Takwa Energy, was a Moroccan power station, and, uh, and several others. So cargo value is for inventory planning upstream in these supply chains. And then when it comes to the time to pick a vessel to transport the cargoes that the company has either purchased or sold, it assists with the vessel nomination process. And then once a vessel is nominated, it assists with the actual shipment process, the voyage. So, the inherent part of this, well, one aspect of cargo value is that it has an integration with a satellite provider. So the information in this platform that you see here is being beamed directly from a satellite provider. That information is coming from the ship's AIS transponders on board the vessels. And it's being updated by hand in most cases by the ship's command. But the problem is the AIS transponders are running basically all the time. So the vessel's static position is very accurate. But by the nature of dry bulk and, and liquid bulk, the vessels are trampers. And for those not from the shipping industry, that means that the ships are not on a line of service. They're not like buses, they're like taxis. They go from port A to port B 
according to where the cargo orders are from. They will, of course, mimic liner trades if they've got a COA or a contract of a freightment or repeat, uh, repeat business. But by and large, these vessels are called to go to different ports to take different cargoes, as the case may be. So that's the biggest difference between um, tramp vessel and container vessels, right? Container vessels have got very fixed um, routes, while tramp vessels, they, it's really dependent on where the demand and supply is. So uh, it's, it's really akin to your taxi's analogy. Correct. Wherever there's a passenger, they pick it up and then they put a passenger down and then they will probably roam around the area. Uh, if there's another passenger to pick up, that's great. And then they're just, you know, to and fro, to and fro, but at no fixed um, lines. Yeah, correct. And there are commercial motivators behind where these ships will sit and wait and where they'll sail and where they, uh, where they collect cargoes from. Uh, anybody who knows the, the Baltic Exchange, they have uh, a list of fixed routes that the different types of bulk carriers usually ply. And of course, world scale for tankers uh, is the other kind of regular routes that tankers travel. Um, so it's not totally random, but mm -hmm. there is still a high degree of randomness to the way these ships behave. Which... Uh, brings us to the challenge of ETAs. So at the moment, our platform, along with a lot of other platforms that, uh, that rely on AIS data, they get one of these, which is an ETA update sent from the ship's bridge to the satellite, which is then sent to, forgive me, I'm not a software expert, but wherever the satellite is beaming that information to Earth, which then sends it to, uh, to our cloud-based platform eventually. So this one's quite good because it's been received 23 minutes ago. So anybody making decisions based on that ETA to this port can make them with a fair degree of accuracy. Uh, if, if that ETA is updated all the time. It may change for any different reason. During the voyage, the vessel may go and collect another parcel of cargo. It may bunker. It may just sit and wait somewhere for any number of reasons. So that, uh, that ETA uh, changes quite a bit. And if it's recorded as it changes, if it keeps everybody informed, it allows really, really good supply chain visibility, which is, uh, which is what we aim to achieve and of course, anybody using this AIS uh, integration. But because the ship's command are navigating a ship, which takes a bit of time, sometimes they let it go a day or so before they update the AIS transponder. And sometimes they let it go two days. And if you're somebody at a port sending or receiving cargo and you're trying to make decisions based on information that's two days old, it's very, very difficult. And so this is where we have, have seen an opportunity for somebody out there in the, uh, in the tech world to come up with a solution, not just for us, but for the whole industry and for anybody using AIS to track vessels. Um, so, we know that uh, the ECDIS or ECDIS system on board ships is a SOLAS uh, approved navigation system. And that if you're on board a vessel and if you're in charge of that vessel and you need to uh, book services and do crew changes and that sort of thing, you're definitely gonna enter the best possible ETA that you have into that ECDIS system, uh, which has been verified by by some seafaring uh, contacts that we have. Uh, the other very accurate form of ETAs is port community systems, uh, like the one we have here in Singapore. Um, they, again, they have to organize harbor pilots, tugs, uh, customs, in this case, uh, COVID related matters. Those ETAs that the port produces or, or at least uh, receives for those vessels can also be very accurate. So 
if the AIS data can somehow be triangulated, or if that ETA can be triangulated with those uh, those three resources, or at least two of them, I'm sure that uh, even if the captain is a little bit busy with paperwork on board the vessel uh, and doesn't update the the AIS transponder, then at least uh, there's there's a data driven uh, way of providing that ETA as accurately as possible for those who need to make decisions based on that ETA. So why is ETA so important for uh, everyone? Well, ships provide a very, very large inventory injection in a supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing when you're going to have that massive injection of industry of inventory is really important. Uh, again, uh, comparing a bus to a car, um, if you were inviting your friends over for dinner and they turned up on a motorbike, uh, you know that you only need to cook the, the maximum of two people. Uh, but if you see a bus turn up outside your house, then you could be needing to cook for somewhere up to 60 people. So if your friends are going to bring all their friends on a bus, they better tell you with a fair bit of notice how many they're bringing and when that bus is arriving. So you can order the right amount of food or cook it. Um, so schedules, I mean, an example is that these ships go to very busy berths with shore-based infrastructure, say a ship loader or a ship unloader. And these are bottlenecks where there are often queues of vessels. And, and as we know, when a ship sits still, it can earn a, a demurrage rate somewhere between 10 and $15,000 a day. So if you say that your ship's coming the 1st of August and it turns up on the 3rd of August and has to wait for another ship to discharge for four days before it can berth, then you've just cost uh, up to $60,000 just by not having the right ETA. And that happens often? Yes, it does. Right, so I guess that helps to answer the question that uh, someone's always asking. Um, and, and just send me an email to ask, uh, to remind the speakers to share how big uh, or how painful the problem is so that it gives this uh, community a little bit more motivation to know, uh, you know, how, how painful this is. So um, they could kind of like size up the market a little bit for, uh, for them. So uh, I think that if you're able to resolve this and it's gonna help, it's gonna do a lot of people a lot of favors and uh, a lot of people are gonna love you because it's a very painful problem and it's industry-wide. Yes, and on, on top of that, it has, uh, it has flow on effects throughout the supply chain, uh, bullwhip effect as they call it. Uh, if you imagine if a ship is one day late, then hundreds of trucks are one day late and then those hundreds of trucks are going to different sites and then the product is inevitably gonna be two days late and then it might be three or four days late uh, by the time it reaches customers. And uh, if you talk about 80,000 tons of cargo, that may be going to literally hundreds or even thousands of different retailers. And if you times three days delay for all of those retailers by several thousand, um, yeah, then, then it, the echo throughout the supply chain is quite significant. Yeah, someone's asked um, two questions related to AIS. So the first one is say, uh, well, why can't AIS update from the ship made automatically on a regular basis, like hourly? I guess um, in this case, it's because it has to be a, a proactive action by uh, usually uh, the captain, I guess. Is that how the update? Okay, so the AIS transponder updates its own position automatically. Mm. So it's always pinging its position up to the satellite automatically. Mm. Nobody needs to do anything. Mm. But of course, it can't automatically tell where the ship's going and what time it's going to get there. That at the moment, to the best of our knowledge, is a largely manual process. We've heard cases where the, the Ectus uh, navigation system interfaces with AIS, but uh, that is not common on trap ships. And someone from Facebook is really asking a solution, uh, a question about the solution. Uh, Claire is wondering if the solution that you're looking at 
would include the three sources of information that you mentioned. I guess that's the AIS, the ECDIS, as well as the port community of uh, information that comes from the, the port community uh, systems. Or uh, if, if they can come up with their own solution, is it possible to tell a little bit more about the, to share a little bit more about the port community platform? Yeah, look, those three were just my ideas from, from, or at least our ideas from our experience in shipping. They're just a catalyst to get people thinking about where else to get this information from. That's definitely not the, not the, uh, the, the aim here is not to get those three things to integrate. The aim is to improve the quality of AIS, AIS ETA updates. So, uh, if anybody has any bright ideas of how they could do this without uh, integrating those three pieces of information, I'm definitely willing to uh, to hear. Uh, so, so the poor, sorry, the poor community system. Um, it's interesting that a ship has to communicate its ETA to vessel agents at origin or, or destination because you imagine that you're you're navigating a vessel. Um, you need to communicate your ETA to the people who are going to organize you tugs, fresh water, fuel, pilotage, all those things. But you're going to do that as priority before you update the AIS transponder. Because the AIS transponder is just kind of a, another thing you've got to do. And it's not, uh, as far as I know, it's not a commercially essential or, or it's not essential to the vessel's navigation. So that, so sorry, go ahead. So by virtue of the priority of task, that's a really long list. So that's why uh, the captain usually updates the agent. So that's why um, that's where the, port, the information from port community uh, platforms come in a lot more uh, timely to indicate when the vessels like to arrive. Yes, because the per and even then this is usually a manual process because as far as I know, uh, port community systems are usually updated by vessel agents. I know that when I was a vessel agent previously, that's what we would literally receive the information from the ship via email and then log into the, uh, the port community database or system and update the information there. So the information in the port community database is usually pretty good. That's straight from the horse's mouth or the, the captain's uh, from the bridge of the vessel rather. So, but again, still a manual process there. And definitely not all ports have port community systems, or if they do, they have very basic ones. Right. Can we look at how um, Plavnus Digital envisions the solution to look like? What would be, uh, what, would we, what, what would a good solution look like to you? A good solution would just be that. It would just be the ETAs uh, received in a timely manner that you can, you can put faith in. Because at the moment, these ETAs are good, but they need to be much better. To, to much make better in, in, so in what sense? Um... As in you need to be able to trust them. And we know from the maritime industry, if you've got an ETA that's two days old, a lot can happen in two days. So you, you, just, can't, uh, you just can't put blind faith in an ETA that's two days old. The chances, in most cases are pretty good that the ship is just maintaining that ETA. Uh, and I've dealt with ship owners that, uh, that have said in, in previous uh, roles that have just said, if you don't hear from us, just assume that the ETA hasn't changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> which No news is good news, basically. That's what he's trying to say. <laughs> uh, but, but silence is deafening as well in that sense. Uh, <laughs> and their idea of a changed ETA is, uh, is very different to a supply chain managers. Um, so nowadays with supply chain management being more and more refined, along with it needs to, needs to be much, much better data. So this, this becomes is an, a bottleneck. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what else do you think, um, how else do you think the solution should look like? Well, uh, I'm a shipping and logistics guy, not a software guy. So uh, I'll throw that out to the uh, to the the mega brains that are probably in the audience listening to um, to think about this one and and see what what solutions that they can come up with. Because again, that triangulation is all that I can think of uh, based on experience. 
but there's also commercial considerations. I mean, uh, I read somewhere that if spot cargoes come up, there's this platform out there that, uh, that assumes that the vessels will sail at full speed to get those cargoes. And so therefore they, they do some kind of, uh, AI calculation to, to see when those vessels are going to get there based on how urgent the cargo is and all sorts of other interesting things. Um, so again, the solution that not only us, but, but the industry as a whole needs is up to the minute ETA updates, the same as we see with, uh, with, with container ships. Right. So essentially that's, that's just what, um, the solution has to do, right. To be able to report, uh, better trustable uh, ETAs. So that's the ultimate goal. And then a hint to the community is that uh, there are three buckets where they can get ETAs in, in various degrees of uh, timeliness. So that's the AIS, the ECDIS, as well as from the port community platforms. So if yep. someone can somehow integrate, uh, you know, this kind of information and then produce an ETA that's trustable, so that's, that's really the goal. Yeah, and you know when you order a grab, you can you can literally see it on the app flying its mm -hmm. way through the streets and giving you uh, an update live, like your grab is two minutes away or three minutes or uh, or whatever. Um, that would of course be the perfect scenario, and that's totally not feasible for uh, for tram ships. But um, maybe one. Oh, that's where it should go head towards, right? Or at least uh, a resemblance of that kind of us uh, outcome. That, that would be the uh, that would be the dream scenario, yes. Right. Uh, don't yeah. don't try and build that though. That's that's un an unnecessarily uh, high level of detail um, for shipping, but to to give you a to give you a concept at least. Yeah, but I mean we know definitely for sure that one day old data is is no good. Yep. Uh, two days is absolutely no no. Uh, so twenty three minutes is it's it's good decent. But if we can uh, keep to that, or maybe even um, reduce it, improve it from uh, 23 minutes. For, for bulk carriers that only sail at 12 to 13 knots, I mean, I would guess you could probably get away with an update every three hours. Sorry, I think somebody asked that earlier. But yeah, look, an update every few hours uh, would, would probably be OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's OK. Actually, uh, I'm not sure how fast that is, uh, 12, 12 to 13 knots. That's equivalent to... About 22 beyond. kilometers an hour. Or, no, oh, okay. wait. <laughs> it's, uh, it's roughly double. So it's somewhere between 24 and 26 kilometers an hour. So sprinting speed for an athletic human. Yeah, that's doable. Okay. All right. We have a few more questions from the audience. Um, Someone asked, is the data passed back to the cloud? I'm assuming this is AI's data. Passed back to the cloud, or does the data integration happen on board vessels it's somewhere in the cloud? I would, oh, you mean now, as it is now? Yeah. Yes, it is. So, of course, of course it happens. It, it, I think it's just a matter of somebody on the ship's bridge types it into a system on the ship's bridge that's, that's linked to the satellite. And the satellite receives it, sends it to the satellite provider's facility. I'm not sure how that looks, but then of course the satellite provider's facility, they then upload it or put out an API or however it works uh, for systems like cargo value to connect with it and then reproduce that information to all the uh, subscribers of cargo value. Right, yeah, uh, that's right too. And someone, Matthews asked, do you receive a full AI's data update or just a snapshot shown? So he's asking uh, what you're showing on a screen right now, is that what you get or is there is there uh, more information beyond what's being shown on the slide right now? That is a good question. I think we can to some degree adjust what information is received. For the sake of simplicity, which we believe is a very, very significant uh, aspect to good supply chain management, all the cargo, you, all the users that uh, that we've found who use cargo value just really want the ETA. Okay. 
Um, actually, I'm just curious. Uh, out of curiosity, you were you were sharing just now that um, for shrimp vessels, the way the the routes that it take uh, is random, but not quite random as well. So, what are the factors that affect uh, how random it is? Uh, as opposed to a container uh, vessel? I mean, it, it, it is based on a lot of things. Fundamentally, uh, who's buying cargo uh, and where that cargo is coming from. And remembering that, a, for example, a Panamax vessel like the ones that Clavinus, uh, Tobol Clavinus operate can take a multitude of different cargoes. So if they've just discharged a cargo in India and then they sail back to Singapore in ballast, they then might take bauxite from Australia to China. They might take grain from Argentina to China. They might take coal from South Africa to India. They have a wide range of cargoes that they can take. So the cargoes have different routes. And then if you think coal, it can go to, I mean, thermal coal can go from anywhere that produces coal to anywhere that needs coal for power generation. And you can imagine that that's quite a complex network. If you're sailing uh, out of Indonesia, having just collected a cargo of coal, you might go to Japan with its power stations, China, might go just around the corner to Thailand. It's it's extremely hard to predict, and those uh, those decisions can be made. I mean, in some cases, again, for the, those not familiar with shipping, um, a cargo can actually change hands multiple times during a voyage, uh, and it can even change ports of ports of discharge during a voyage. Um, so, it's uh, and this these decisions are made by people in offices who are doing deals every day, which of course is uh, very, very hard to capture in, in terms of data. So, so do these, these, these changes or rather the route planning happen very, I mean, how, how I guess what I'm trying to say is that how, how much in advance are they planned out? Because I, correct me if I'm wrong, for a bulk carrier, you have, I can't remember what you call it, but then there are like those rooms they are on a vessel where they are used to contain or store things like grains and cement and, and coal. And then on, on a carrier, depending on the size, um, you can have multiple storage rooms, right? Uh, cargo holds, yeah. Cargo holds. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, let's say if it sells from, from, from Australia, so you pick up grain, so uh, it may not be, let's say it has five. It may not be all five being filled up with grain. So maybe they fill two out of five. And so you're saying that on the way to somewhere else, they could pick up something else. But is that is that route being planned out much in advance? Or like, you know, when they plan out, they would say that if I need to clear out five cargo holds, I know just before it leaves Australia exactly where it's supposed to go. Or could it be like I'm picking up two cargo holds worth of grains from Australia. And then I know that I'm supposed to discharge it in India. So while on the way to India, but um, I'm being told that suddenly I need to stop by somewhere else to pick up coal. I'm just saying. And then, so I, I do a detour to somewhere else to pick up coal and, and then I, I move back to India to discharge grains. Is that, is that how it's like? Or is it like, you know, they already know where exactly they have to go to, to, to fill up those five cargo holds? So it can be like that in an extreme circumstance. Hmm. It, yeah, that, that, that can happen. Um, and vessels can literally be, as they're passing a certain port, Somebody could even ring up and say, hey, I've got this cargo here. Do you want it? And the vessel can literally change course um, <laughs> within a matter of hours and collect another cargo and keep sailing. Um, ship owners are very happy with that because they don't have to ballast very far to get the cargo. Um, but, uh, okay, so it's, when I say that happens, most of the cargo is fixed on contract basis. So... A power oh. station, a power station might agree to supply sixty to eighty percent of its cargo from a certain mine uh, for a whole year in advance. Mm. So in that case, that'll be say eighty thousand tons a month of X Y Z product. Right. So there are that's where a, a, 
a bulk carrier would take on characteristics of a of a liner because it's just going back and forth yeah. collecting coal yeah. and taking it to that power station. There's so. a certain level of certainty that you have to fulfill part of that contract, right? So you Correct. know that, that that route is fixed at the very least. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, uh, we have time for probably just one more question. Uh, someone's asking, do you have sample data available from ECDIS and, and a port community uh, platform? I don't. And this brings us to a bit of a hurdle, and I'm glad you asked that, um, because companies may not be willing to share that information uh, all the time. Because if you've just booked a cargo that, uh, that is quite confidential, um, mm. and you have to make a little bit of a detour to collect that cargo, um, you may not want the whole world to know about it. Right. So. Right. Okay, understand. That's, a, that's an inherent problem. Uh, and also port community. Uh, you, you know what? You, you can log on to most ports and they'll have some kind of port community system. Uh, I mean, you can just go, just type in uh, Port of Singapore schedule or Jurong port shipping schedule and the shipping schedule will be there. Uh, that's publicly available information for, for I would say, most ports. Uh, even the ones you may not expect. For example, the port of Mozambique has quite an advanced... Uh, port community system. Um, so th that's publicly available info. Uh, and yeah, the other question is how willing are ship owners to share their the data from their Ectus navigation system? So that's another big question mark. Uh, but of course, all this needs further investigation. Right. I think, Matthew, what I'm going to do is let me find out if we are able to get you the uh, platform, the port community platform on uh, data that's available. Um, I'll check in with colleagues and then uh, if I can, I'll share with you at the end of the session, probably tomorrow. Okay, all right. So I think that's about it. Uh, we don't have any more questions that we are going to answer um, on this um, live here today. So thank you so much, Tim. Um, any, any words of encouragement for those that are attending? today's session because uh, this is the group of people that are likely to be putting in proposals to answer your innovation opportunity and of course uh, also those that are watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, think outside the box and, uh, and don't be constrained by what tr traditional shipping people say. Right, okay. That's, that sounds good. Good advice. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you okay. so much. Um, thank you, folks. I'll see you again in the next session uh, that we have uh, this Thursday. And it's on, um, yeah, it's coming on your screen right now. It's something that's very different. We are talking about uh, analytics and, and visual analytics and with AI and stuff like that, but for different applications. Okay, so I'll see you again on Thursday. Bye. Bye, Tim. <laughs>